Hello guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about Feroxanes and Ferrazanes. As always, I would love to give a huge thank you to all my Templist Dollar patrons for their massive donation. So a few months ago, I came up with a great idea. I came across two compounds that I really liked. Uh, the first compound is called DNAF. This is a Ferrazin. And um, the other one is a BNTFO1, which is a Ferroxane. Bet you guys can't uh, guess what happens when you look up Ferrazanes, Ferroxanes. Yeah, it's fucking furries. Oh, hey, look, my video's at the bottom. So these compounds are very similar to each other. The only reason why I'm making both and the real difference between them is that um, one of them, Ferrazanes, are 1,2,5-oxidiazole, and Ferroxanes are 1,2,5-oxidiazole-2-oxide. So it's a very small difference. However, that oxide both stabilizes the molecule and makes it more powerful. So in general, ferroxanes are much better than ferrazanes. Okay, so the first thing I actually tried to do in this whole line of syntheses uh, was make the DPX1 for the BNTFO synthesis. A uh, funny thing I found while reading about this compound is um, it turns out that DPX1 is actually a product of fulminic acid. Yes, fulminates, the acid of fulminate and uh, it's a product of the hydrolysis of it, which I found really, really cool. Uh, it turns out uh, it takes like a kilogram of mercury fulminate to make one gram of DPX1, and that's what scientists used to do back in the, uh, pff, probably the 60s. Thankfully, we live in a good old age where we actually have better syntheses, where I only need nitromethane and oleum instead of a kilogram of uh, pff, mercury fulminate. So to start the synthesis of the uh, DPX1, we're gonna first have to make nitroacetaldehyde oxide. Now I did this by uh, reacting nitromethane with a sodium hydroxide solution. And after a while and some heating, I get this really dark red solution in which I uh, neutralize with HCl and that yields me um, a, a seemingly significant amount of nitroacetaldehyde oxide. However, I run into a huge problem when doing the extraction step. I actually had such a problem with this because I kept on consistently getting uh, extremely low yields, like 10% or less, that I actually emailed the makers of the paper. And I mean, they gave me suggestions, but I just didn't have the proper equipment to successfully do this. So I actually ended up giving up, not on making the DPX1. I actually did successfully make that. Uh, I had just reacted the nitroacetaldehyde oxide that I had from a few reactions put together, and I did end up uh, actually getting around two grams of it total. So in the end, at least I did make a ferroxin, but the uh, I never managed to make the BNTFO one because I just didn't have enough precursor. Now, since this stuff was my final product, I did have to recrystallize it because pff, why would I not? So uh, you actually recrystallize it using nitromethane, and I really got to say, this was some of the worst stuff I have ever crystallized before. Uh, it turns out it's not even that soluble in nitromethane, and heating it too much seems to um, actually decompose it. So it's, it's awful. Also, once this stuff dissolves, it really does not like to crystal out. So I actually ended up having to evaporate all of the nitromethane. Um, but of course, I decanted off the gross stuff, as you can see in that beaker. But still, it's, it was very annoying. Okay, boom, done with that. Now we move on to DNAF. So this DNAF synthesis wasn't necessarily harder. This one's just kind of daunting because of all the uh, steps and the fact that I had to repeat it. Yeah, it was not very fun the day that my entire reaction failed because of one small mistake. Uh, turns out leaving it in DCM overnight doesn't really treat it well and it completely destroyed it and left it to be just completely destroyed. I don't even, I don't even exactly know what happened to it. Uh, it still burned really well, however, it didn't explode at all. I also uh, screwed up when desiccating it because I accidentally let in air too fast and it was, I was not having a good day. Moving on, uh, just a very quick summary of the synthesis is I started with glyoxine and then from glyoxine I turned it into diaminoglyoxine and then after that 
This is the longest step because it took me forever to get a pressure reactor. Not a bomb. I had to react the diaminoglyoxime in basic conditions uh, inside of water at 180 C. So I needed a pressure reactor for that. And uh, yeah, simple. Did that easy. High yield. I actually got higher than the paper, which made me pretty happy. And um, yeah, so from there, I turned the DAF or the uh, diaminoferrazin into DAAF, which stands for diaminoazoxyferrazin. This last step was probably the worst because it was when I had to turn the DAAF into DNAF, which stands for dinitroazoxyferrazin. And the reason why it was so bad was because I had to react it in extremely oxidizing conditions, which is uh, uh, essentially piranha solution with an ammonium persulfate buffer. Uh, for eight hours, so that was not very fun. However, I gotta say, it did easily oxidize those amines. So here is our proper yellow, yes, yellow product, and it's not orange, which means it actually worked. Okay, yes, yes. Now it's what you've all been waiting for, the actual explosion part. Okay, so as our first test, let's try burning DPX1. First up is indirect flame. Pretty good. And now let's try direct. So DPX1 was actually a pretty good burn, but you could see a lot of carbon residue, which is, um, really shows the flaw with this, uh, explosive. It's very oxygen negative. However, um, those crystals that I made when I recrystallized actually burn so much better than the crude product. I don't have a video of the crude product burning, but take my word for it. Okay, so now let's do a burn test with the DNAF. Now, first things first, we're going to do a direct flame. And now we're going to do an indirect flame. So yeah, that was actually really good. Um, as you can see, there was no residue left, and uh, they burnt really quickly. So I'm also going to show you guys the burn of DAAF, kind of for the sake of, um, I guess, science. Just to show you the real difference between the amino and the nitro, because the only difference between those two compounds is four oxygens. Alright, so I'm just going to give it directly to give it the highest chance to actually burn. As you can see, a lot worse. Uh, the shock and friction tests really weren't that interesting. Uh, DPX1 is actually like less sensitive than TNT, so obviously I couldn't get that to set off by a hammer at all. Um, however, the DNAF kind of surprised me because the paper said it was fairly sensitive. However, I found that it's maybe not as sensitive. I don't know. I could just be fucking it up. Oh, I got it. Okay, so now it's time for the can tests. First up, we're going to do 50 milligrams, starting with DPX1. Okay, so for the 50 milligram test, I actually had to do something really weird because this stuff is really hard to set off, as you saw by the hammer test. So I'm actually using um, a little bit of silver nitro tetrazole with some uh, DNAF, and that should be able to get this to set off. If that can't set this off, then nothing can. All right, time to see the power of the peroxide. Yeah, that set it off. You guys saw that it kind of like stalled for a second. That was kind of scary. Almost didn't go off. But as you see, it ended up doing it, so yay. Okay, so now we're going to do the 50 milligram uh, can test for the DNAF. Okay, cool. That worked. Now, we actually need to be able to compare these can tests to something, so I set up a 50 milligram ETN test. Wow, that went far. Now, I swear, there's something I'm missing. It's... <sighs> so, hold up.
Wait a second. <gasps> Guys, I figured it out. One of them has to be a furry. So I actually came up with a flawless plan in order to find which one is the uh, furry. So my plan is I will print out a picture of a furry. Do not worry, I cleansed both my phone and the printer after getting these pictures and printing them. Sorry, printer, you had to go through that. So don't worry about that. And I'm going to tape them to a can and see which energetic does more damage. Because the one that does the most damage obviously does not like the furry as much. So whichever one does the least amount of damage is our confirmed furry. Oh, also a disclaimer, I know that a lot of my viewers are probably furries. So I actually have something to show you so you don't get mad. Okay, I got, I got permission to blow up furries. <laughs> As you can see there, permission granted. Okay, so here's what the cans look like. And uh, we're just gonna put them on the stone, tape the energetic right in the middle to get even distribution. And uh, let's test them. First step is DNAF. Remember, this chemical is yellow as can be. Oh boy. I don't think that furry survived. Now it's time for DPX1. Hmm, look at the smoke. It's like it didn't want to detonate. Okay, so comparing cans, we have clearly seen which one's the furry. Obviously the uh, DPX1, sorry, confirmed furry. Jokes aside, these were actually 100 milligram can tests. So um, you can see the insane power of the DNAF versus the uh, DPX1. Now, even though the DPX1 is a ferroxin and the DNAF is a ferrozin, this is a rare case where the ferrozin is actually more powerful. Uh, DNAF is actually, I think, the most powerful ferrozin known today because it it even beats most ferroxins, which you almost never see. So this ferrozin isn't really a fair, uh, you know, comparison. It's the outlier of the group. Also, comparing the uh, 50 milligram can test, you can see the DNAF, the DPX1, and the ETN all compared with 50 milligram tests of each other. You can see that the ETN and DNAF were fairly similar. However, the DNAF had more shrapnel holes and it had a slightly bigger hole. And obviously DPX1 had like nothing, it was just a little hole. So you can see the real power difference between ETN, which is obviously a lot more common, and uh, these other two, DNAF and DPX1. Now there is one last thing I do want to go over, and it's about a property of DNAF. You can actually melt cast the stuff, because the melting point is low enough where you don't really have to worry about it decomposing on you, or, you know, exploding. So. Essentially, I took a little bit, around 50 milligrams right here, and I melted it into a little bead, because obviously, the more dense it is, the more powerful it's going to be. Okay, so let's test this stuff. So I somehow lost the clip of it, but essentially it didn't turn out very well. Um, you can see that barely any of it actually did explode, and uh, I think that's because I may have baked it too much. So yeah, oops. In conclusion, uh, this isn't really a fair comparison, because uh, essentially we pack-a-punched the DAAF, but didn't pack-a-punch the, the DPX-1. So it's like comparing, you know, the M1911 to the uh, Mustang Sound. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. If you guys enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing. This video took me around four months to film, and I both didn't have that much time, and I actually put a ton of work into this video. I don't think I've ever put this much work into one project or slash video. Anyways, guys, see you in 46 weeks.